install leaders. <coughs> leaders in particular to this church, but never so less significant than leaders in the world. We are all leaders of some sort. Whether you want it or not, you are a leader. We are leaders. We are called to be children of light and the salt of this world. Whether we go home, we are to be leaders in the home. Whether we are on our jobs, we are leaders on our jobs. Whether we're at school or on the playground, we are leaders. We are Christian. And Christians, all of us, are called to be witnesses. That implies we are leaders in bringing people to Christ. And what we do and what we say as leaders impacts others. And we should be ever so careful to make sure that we behave and we say things that are appropriate for servant leadership. That's five dollars. <laughs> Our lesson comes from Exodus, and uh, the silver feathers on Thursdays uh, are in the book of Exodus, and we're finally getting to chapter 32, and I thought it might be well appropriate for us today to learn some lessons as taken from chapter 32. 32 about leadership, in particular servant leadership, and the scripture lesson comes from Exodus 32, verses 17 through 14. When you get home, you can read that section of the Bible, but we want to focus in on verses 10 and 11, and it's taken from the New King James Version of our Bible. It reads thusly, Now therefore, let me alone that my wrath may turn hot or burn hot against them, and I may consume them. And I will make of you a great nation. And then verse 11, Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? For just a few moments, we want to share with you words around this thought, servant leadership, refuse to do nothing. Servant leadership, refuse to do nothing. Say that with me. Servant leadership, refuse to do nothing. In this particular scenario in the Bible that Moses wrote, it is significant that he recalled his personal encounter with God on behalf of the children of Israel. And that when Moses had ascended to the mountain and was there for a long time, around 40 days, the children of Israel decided that they needed something of a tangible God that they could see. And they encouraged, in fact, influenced Aaron, Moses' brother, to make for them a golden calf so they could worship that golden calf. They had sinned, and God said that they had 
corrupted themselves. So Moses is there with God, receiving the law from God, receiving God's commandments, receiving God's word. He was there atop the mountain or on the mountain while the people below were sinning. The people that Moses was responsible for in terms of leadership were sinning. And here in the ninth verse, God says, I have seen this people, Moses was there with him, but God said, I have seen this people, that they are a stiff-necked people, and they are sinning. And, and, and Moses is there, um, and he hears this, that God is very displeased with the people that Moses was leading, and God says that I'm going to consume them all. I'm going to do away with them all, and get this as part of that 10th verse, and I'm going to make a great nation of you. Imagine yourself as Moses being a leader of a people who are very stubborn, very hard to get along with. In fact, some of those same people earlier on had threatened to kill him. They did not want him around. They were murmuring all the time. They were complaining all the time. They were like us. They were like any organization, and in particular the church, where it is very difficult to be a leader of such people. That no matter what you do, someone is going to complain. No matter whether you give them gold, somebody will say, I want it platinum. Whether you give them platinum, they're going to complain that it's too heavy. You should give us something more lighter to carry. Uh, it's just, just how people are. And leaders are tasked with such a heavy burden of being that sounding board, being that scapegoat, being that sometimes floor mat, absorbing all of that which the team will dish out. Leaders have that special task, that wonderful task that humble task of navigating through all of that. And here, God says, your people, get this, your people <laughs> have corrupted themselves, okay? And, 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 and leaders, when faced with the task of representing folk that are unruly, folk that they are leading, uh, will come to a point where the Lord will test, will show that leader what's inside of them on whether or not the call of leadership, servant leadership, is heeded with the humble law. So God says to Moses, hmm, leave me alone. I'm going to wipe these people out. Imagine yourself being in Moses saying, hmm, hmm, uh, that's good. <laughs> huh? Because he says, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. You mean that I can start all over? that the people who grumble against you and the people who grumble against me, they will be no more. Hmm? That I can rear up or lead people after these people have been wiped out, but I can lead people who's going to do like I ask them to, who's not going to grumble, 
who's not going to cause me any heartache or heartburn or high blood pressure? You mean to tell me that's a choice that I can make? Or I'm uh, hearing you right, Lord, are you going to do this? And God did tell him that. That these people, these stiff necked people, these people who are corrupting themselves, who are going after other gods, I'm going to wipe them out. Sometimes I feel that hmm, if God would give me a choice of the people that I'm supposed to be leading, if he would just wipe them out. Hmm? Have you ever been put into a situation where you're leading people, the household that you're leading, the group that you're leading, the person that you're responsible for, that sometimes God would just wipe them out? Hmm? That I won't have to worry about this person, that I won't have to care for this person, that I won't have to put up with these people or this person anymore. Hmm. But there, I believe, to be a long pause between verse 10 and verse 11. After God told Moses that he should leave him alone, that he is going to consume these people, I imagine Moses thought, took a pause. And he then did something. He did not leave God alone. Lesson one, leaders do not leave God alone. We want to ensure that the people that we love, the people that we're leading, the people that we're responsible for, is kept before God. And that we plead mercy, or plead for mercy, for the people that we are leading. Leaders, servant leadership requires that we do something. Hmm? Good leaders, no matter what the organization may be, are people of action. People who will not just do nothing. If something needs to be done, then leaders will go about it and see that it will be done, particularly servant leaders. And Moses here does something that every leader should do for his or her team or his or her persons that they are responsible for. They do this first. And in verse, 10, verse 11, it says that Moses pleaded hmm, with the Lord. Servant leaders, good servant leaders, faithful servant leaders, those who love the Lord, they pray for those whom they are leading. That's the first thing that we as leaders can do is pray for those folk who are in our lives. For those folk that we meet on the playground or at work or at the grocery store. For those work that we, for those people that we are called to be leaders of, to be lights for, to be salt of, then we pray for those people. We pray for them, whether they want our prayers or not. We pray for them, whether they like us or not. We pray for them, whether they're appreciative or not. We pray for them. We pray for them because that is what God is testing Moses and us on whether or not we are humble enough to pray for those of whom we are responsible for, no matter how good or how bad they are. No matter whether they're getting on our last day or whether they're the joy of our day, it does not matter. We pray. And those who are installed as our leaders today, we are challenged to pray for those people whom we are leading. We pray not just once a year when it's time to do installation, but we pray every day. For those whom we are leading. Men, do you pray for your families at home? 
Women, do you pray for your families at home? Do you pray for your children at home? Do we pray for one another? Do we pray for the school administrators? Do we pray for those folk who are behind prison bars? Do we pray for those people who are victims? Do we pray for those folk who are in the White House? Do we pray for those folk who are homeless? Do we pray for those folk who are in executive a position? Do we pray for those folk? Do you pray for the bishop? Do you pray for the cardinals? Do you pray for the pope? Do you pray for those people that are part of God's children? Because Moses came back at God and says, these are your people. These are not my people. No matter what you may think, all God's children are God's children. All people that you meet are God's children. Those who have confessed their sins or not, they are all God's people. Those who proclaim their heritage as children of God or not, they are all God's people. No matter whether you're Choctaw, Chickasaw, Cheyenne, it does not matter. We are all creations of God. And they're God's people. Whether they're in the church or out the church, they're God's people. And we, as leaders, must have a view that I'm talking, I am behaving, I am witnessing to another creation of God. And God who died for us and for others deems that person or those persons precious in his sight. Enough that he would die, give his life for that person. So we as leaders must not do nothing. Servant leadership requires that we do something that we pray for those people. And I can't give this and I can't do this. We can pray. We can all we pray. In fact, that's how we ought to start our prayer when it comes down to intercessory prayer for others. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. That is the 15th chapter, the 5th verse of the gospel according to John. He in turn goes down to the 7th chapter and says, Acts of me in my name and there will be nothing impossible for you. Accident shall be given. That connects prayer with our connection to Christ, who has promised us that apart from him, we can do nothing. So we start with Christ. Moses started with God in terms of being the intercessor for a people that stiff necked, a people that was resistant of God's commandment. Even those people mm, needed mercy. Needed for the leader, Moses, to intercede on their behalf. Too many times we get into a position, and that position goes to our head. Clergy is at the top of the list. Clergy by nature, we're all narcissistic. A little bit of narcissistic. I'm not calling, but anyway, we, we, we have that responsibility of leading God's children, hopefully by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but many times in this Western culture of what we call leadership, sometimes makes us full of ourselves, that we don't pray for uh, so-and-so. We'll just use some skill in handling a person. We'll go to school and say, this is how you resolve conflict. We go to school and we learn the skills for listening and negotiation. All of that is good in terms of skill. But when we get beside ourselves and lead out and leave out the functioning of the Holy Spirit, when we don't pray for those whom we are needing, then we fall miserably because we are responsible for the salvation 
process to those whom we are leading. Every time we open our eyes, we have an opportunity to lead, to be a servant for those whom God has put in our lives. And every time we are like Moses, given the opportunity to say, yes, Lord, I will do nothing. I'll just lead them to themselves. I'll let it be worked out. I'll, I'll, I'll just let things roll like they roll. And if they roll like they roll, then I might not see her anymore. I might not see him anymore. That person is out of my life. But we are all called to be servant leaders, whereas we don't let a day go by without being a servant and praying for one another. We do something. We call that person up. We say hello. We give that person a hug. We give that person a way to come back to the church. We give that person forgiveness. We give that person love. We give that person peace. We give that person all the things that will help that person be what God is calling them to be. That is a leader. That is a servant leader. Christ was the example of servant leadership in that he became obedient even unto death for you and for me. Christ showed us what an obedient servant leader is about where he stooped and washed his disciples' feet. Even Judas' feet. He washed his feet. God gave us an example. And here in this passage of scripture, we see that Moses refused to do nothing. He prayed to God for a people that he come to love. He prayed to God for people that miss the mark. He prayed to God for people that was resistant to him. Do you find yourself in a situation like this? As being a leader in your home or on your job or here at the church? Man, that's good news. That's good news. If you didn't do it yesterday, you can start today praying for those whom you are responsible for. Praying for those who you are leading. Praying for those and refusing not to just let a day go by without doing something for those people. Servant leaders, they refuse to do nothing. They refuse to just sit there and idly and let people die and go to hell. <coughs> Servant leaders refuse to do nothing. They speak up for that which is of justice. Servant leaders refuse to do nothing by loving the unlovable. Servant leaders refuse to do nothing by forgiving those who despitefully misuse us. Servant leaders refuse to do nothing but going the second mile as well as the first mile. Servant leaders refuse to do nothing by giving and giving sacrificially, giving unto others. Servant leaders refuse to do nothing by loving those who don't love us back. Servant leaders refuse to do nothing by saying hallelujah. Thank you, God, in all circumstances. Servant leaders, take in those who we once cast out. Servant leaders, refuse to do nothing by even forgiving ourselves. Servant leaders, refuse to do nothing by dropping their pride. Servant leaders refuse to do nothing by giving to God's work. Not for the pleasing of men, but for the pleasing of God. Servants <coughs> of men and women give their life to Christ. What we do and what we say wholeheartedly is for
before the Lord. And when we do, we avoid temptation where we want to zap people out of this world. When we do, we avoid saying, this person needs not come to this church anymore. When we do, we avoid those circumstances where we shut out Christ in other people's lives. Servant leadership is what we all are about and should be about here at this church. If you are president of the youth, you're a servant leader and you should lead the others unto Christ. If you're president of the United Methodist men or United Methodist women, then you are servant unto us all. I am a servant to you, not to be served, but to serve you, to continue to hold you up before God in prayer, no matter what you do or what you say, no matter how fallen you have failed, no matter what sin you have committed, for we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are to keep each other lifted up in prayer. Servant leadership refused to do nothing. In 2016, will we refuse to do nothing? Or, we, or will we just let things happen? Will we refuse to do nothing? <laughs> 